So what does the inventor of the light bulb have to do with BitTorrent? And how can a director named Cecil be the ultimate badass? Film School wanted to take a look back at how piracy changed the movies, but what we found is that piracy built the movies. Buckle your seatbelts, mateys. It's time to get Film School. Pirates have always been a subject of great cinema. Uh, no, not that kind of piracy. We're talking about the piracy of ideas. And in regards to cinema, a lot is at stake. Millions of dollars, thousands of jobs, and the creative integrity of some of humanity's most profound artistic achievements. This isn't about not using BitTorrent or popcorn time. Although, when you do that, you hurt the industry you love. Like, hugging someone so hard you break their ribs. Before the turn of the 20th century, the film industry, if you could even call it that, was really just a bunch of guys who figured out how to take lots of pictures in succession, creating the illusion of motion. In fact, early copyrights attempted to protect each and every frame on one sheet of paper because they were dumb idiots. But it wasn't their fault. No one knew what to make of this new moving medium, and no one knew how to define its authorship. The problem with this budding industry was that for all its multi-billion dollar potential, it was a rotten, lawless wasteland of crooks and deviants trying to pull one over on the next guy so they could get their slice of the money pie, which is the most delicious pie. These days, everything is different. Actually, no, it's almost exactly the same and pretty much the same sort of people. First things first, let's address the elephant in the room. St. Thomas Edison, the guy responsible for the light bulb, the phonograph, and the American patent on the motion picture camera, was involved in every landmark piracy copyright case until 1912. That was because Edison wanted it all. He wanted fast cash and easy women, or at least the patents on both the fast cash and easy women. Edison wanted a monopoly on all things movies, or as they called them back then, flickers. He wanted full control of the ability to make movies, to distribute movies, and to project those movies. He even wanted to be the sole manufacturer and dealer of motion picture cameras. Cue him stroking a white cat in an underground lair. Anyone who gets in my way is in for some serious trouble. They'll have to face the full might of the trust. <laughs> so let's back up. We'll get to the trust in a minute. In the very early days of motion pictures, around 1895, there were no laws or any sort of ethics protecting the rights of films or filmmakers. Filmmakers and theaters had little regard for camera machine patents, and many would manufacture their own versions of other people's instruments. Kind of like the Nintendo V. Even more vulnerable than the hardware were the films themselves. Unabashed copying was unauthorized and considered standard practice in the early days of the industry. Even Edison had built his business model on duping other people's films. French and English films were the most susceptible to duplication because they were less likely to have U.S. patents. So when a new film came out, it was the fastest dupers who were the ones to profit most. Even the films of Georges Millier, which were shown legitimately in the United States, were also pirated and smuggled out of France to be brought to America. Early film piracy was fairly simple. One, get your hands on a film that you really like. Let's say A Trip to the Moon. My audience will love that! <laughs> Two, run an unexposed film strip next to the film you want to copy. Three, shine a light through both strips of film. Four, voila! You got your own negative. Am I rich yet? <laughs> Step five is you repeat with the negative and an unexposed film strip to make a new print. And six, you make as many copies as your evil money grubbing heart desires. All of the copies! <laughs> piracy is delicious. Mm, mm, mm. Also a victim of piracy in the early days of cinema? Adaptations. Yes, even from the beginning, the movie industry was fraught with adaptations and remakes, though very rarely authorized. The novel Ben-Hur was a huge hit for its publisher, but it was adapted unofficially time and time again before the courts knew how to define the relationship between literature and film. Piracy of movies became so widespread that film companies began painting their company logo onto sets appearing in their own films. The Edison trademark can be seen on a burning wall in Life of an American Fireman, and the American Biograph logo can be seen on a street organ in her first adventure and is also easy to spot throughout the Lonely Villa. It's kind of like how we put a Cinefix logo in the bottom right corner. Right? See it down there? Yeah. How exactly does this prevent pirating? We have no idea. And they didn't either, but with all the rampant pirating, it was at least one way to prove what films belonged to whom. In 1897, Edison began his determined battle for complete control. In years of endless court cases, he fought over who had the right to determine the shape and size of sprocket holes in film strips, over the difference between hand-cranked filmmaking and automatic filmmaking, and over the right to protect and distribute film. But one of Edison's strongest claims was over film loops. For the following 11 years, Edison claimed a copyright on loops. Known as the Latham Loop, this copyrighted technology isolates the film strip from vibration and tension, allowing movies to be continuously shot and projected for extended periods of time. Edison's claim was that because of the Armat patent on the Latham Loop, a patent he owned, he had rights on a specific loop in film machines. We're not making this up, he had a claim on the shape of the loop. 
You see that right there? That was apparently owned by Edison. And in court, a federal judge upheld the validity of Edison's Latham Loop. So he actually owned the loops. All the loops! <laughs> but not all of Edison's claims came out of court so fruitful, including the claim that he invented the motion picture process in 1889. Then this battle over cinema came to the boxing ring in 1899. Literally. American Biograph, one of Edison's rivals, set up a massive indoor lighting rig in order to film their first movie illuminated by electricity. The lights had to be massive, because at this point film stock was slow and typically needed the bright light of the sun to expose a decent image. In fact, the lights were so hot that they burned the hair from the top of both fighters' heads. The Jeffrey Sharkey's fight was to be filmed exclusively by American Biograph, who spent an arm and a leg setting up these massive lighting rigs. However, 20 rows back, a competing motion picture company, Vitagraph, set up their own camera to film the match. When the Biograph people people found out about the Vitagraph crew, they were pissed, and they sent a team of Pinkerton detectives to confiscate the machine. Because the audience surrounding Vitagraph was eager to watch a public beating, they rallied and blocked the detectives from reaching Vitagraph, and their blockade ended up causing more commotion outside the ring than the boxing match itself. But Vitagraph's Albert E. Smith was able to record the entire fight, and in all the commotion, he smuggled the film out of the arena and had the film developed in the Vitagraph lab. But it gets better. The next morning, Smith discovered that the film he had illegally pirated had been pirated out of his own lab. And who do you think was responsible this time? <laughs> none other than one of Thomas Edison's own inside men. So even though Biograph went through all the trouble of setting up lights and paying boxing promoters, it was Vitagraph and Edison who carried the money to the bank. Biograph got zilch. Now let's talk about the trust. In 1908, in partnership with his former rival Biograph and others, Edison formed the Motion Pictures Patents Company, otherwise known as The Trust. The trust licensed equipment built under Edison's patents to willing producers, thus helping cement the monopoly Edison always wanted. The trust not only sued people who tried to make their own camera system, but also began taking more extreme measures to mark their territory, like peeing on cameras. I'm, I'm joking, they didn't do that. With the growing popular and financial success of movies, the trust and Edison's demands became increasingly difficult to deal with, and the danger for anyone opposing the trust became more real. This is why Carl Lemley, Cecil B. DeMille, Samuel Goldwyn, and D.W. Griffith, the titans of Hollywood, ended up in Hollywood. It was about as far away from Edison as they could get without leaving the country. If not for the trust, Hollywood would probably still be in New Jersey, because that's where Edison was, and that would suck. Or not, I don't, I've actually never been to Jersey, I hear it's quite nice. By 1912, there were dozens of companies in Hollywood, and with weather like this, and a wide variety of natural environments to film, and hardly any traffic on the 405, no one looked back. Pissed and frustrated in his ivory tower that light bulbs built, Edison sent private detectives to prowl the states for anyone shooting films. He managed to coerce some of the smaller companies into agreeing to whatever terms he set, but as more companies fled to areas like Cuba, Florida, and of course California, the trust had to step up their game. Like any rational business, they hired a group of thugs to shut down unauthorized productions. How would these thugs display power and authority over shutting down productions? Well, it's funny you should ask. If producers didn't agree to Edison's terms, they got bullets in their cameras. That's not a metaphor. That was Edison's preferred method of shutting down productions, and crew members' lives were at risk. In his biography, Cecil B. DeMille claims that he was shot at on numerous occasions. DeMille was certain the trust was trying to kill him. So, like many of the others who moved to Hollywood, he slept in his studio. I mean, who can afford real estate prices? He also kept his shotgun nearby, rode a horse to work, and was known to carry a revolver hanging off his belt in plain sight. Over time, his firearm collection grew so large that he started using them as props for movies. Okay, now here's the part that's so insane we wouldn't even try to make it up, because you'd be like, nah. -uh. Cecil B. DeMille, the man responsible for some of the most epic Hollywood films of all time, kept a wolf in his home. And you thought your pit bull Mr. Fancy was tough. Sure, the wolf was tame and was featured in the 1914 film The Squaw Man, but who fucks with a dude who owns a wolf? Sabotage had already taken place at the laboratory and anonymous death threats were arriving in the mail, but if riding a horse to work and carrying a revolver on his belt weren't enough of a warning to Edison's thugs, the wolf definitely sealed the deal. The Edison Trust was finally dissolved by court order in 1918, setting the way for the motion picture industry to really flourish in the 1920s. Hollywood would be better for it. Relocating to California started as an act of defiance, but the right to produce and exhibit movies is an art form that shouldn't be monitored by a gun-toting monopoly that shoots your cameras. Seriously, Edison was a power-hungry bully. In a day and age where we have the ability to produce Sundance-worthy films on our cell phones and digital piracy is way out of control, it's good to recognize that the next time you're illegally streaming your favorite TV show, you couldn't have done it without the hard work and piracy of cinema's forefathers, especially Thomas Edison and Cecil B. DeMille. Till next time, cinema nerds. Class dismissed. Ring. That's the bell. That's the, that's the sound of the class bell being rung.